In America, February is Black History Month, so this month we're taking a look at a collection of black mixologists, both historical and modern, who've made great contributions to the world of cocktails. Today we'll be talking about Tom Bullock, the first black American bartender to publish a cocktail manual in 1917, on today's episode of Mike's Hard Reviews. Hey there, hi there, ho there, my name is Michael. Welcome back to Mike's Hard Reviews. It's lovely to have you all here today. I'm a bartender and mixologist from Kalamazoo, Michigan, and we're gonna talk about Tom Bullock, one of the first major cocktail authors, and in fact, the first black American author to publish a cocktail manual. Before we get to his cocktail manual, though, I wanna take a step back and look at Tom Bullock, his life, where he was raised, and how that plays a role in him becoming a major, in fact, one of the most popular bartenders pre-prohibition. Thomas Bullock was born on October 18th, 1872 to his mother Jenny and father Thomas, who would become the oldest of three siblings, himself, Lena, and Clarence. The family was based out of Louisville, Kentucky, which is kind of fitting because Thomas's father was a former Union soldier, and during the Civil War, the city of Louisville was a very prominent stronghold for Union forces. The fact that this is where the family is based actually plays a significant role in Thomas's ability to become a member of the hospitality industry, and specifically a bartender. There's a lot of sort of intersectional history here that makes that possible, but allow me to try to explain it as best as I can. Post-Civil War, when Reformation kicks in, there's a lot of blossoming opportunity in Louisville, not just because it is one of the few cities that you can still pass trade from the north to the deep south, but because it has to change. It's subject to the shifting of rules, the freeing of enslaved black people. And as a result, there's a lot of blossoming industry that has to be managed. And because black people can now work in positions that they previously couldn't, there's a lot of opportunity for them to take a hold. You see, black people weren't really allowed to be bartenders back in the day. And the reason for that is because it would bring you closer to a lot of traditionally very powerful, very rich, very white people. And white people didn't want to have that proximity. So they wouldn't, simply wouldn't allow it. This goes for both the South and the North, actually, because at this time, the only place that you're really going to see a black American bartender is in an institution that is catering specifically to black patrons. Whereas in the South, black people weren't allowed to have these roles whatsoever, and the exceptions to that are very, very uncommon. In the North, black people were seen as very strong competition. And while the North did fight to end slavery through the Civil War, they were in truth no less racist than the South. Well, that's a little bit mis a misnomer, but there were still issues with race. And that meant that black people were simply outed from the industry because white people did not want to work alongside them. Louisville is an exception to a lot of these rules because it is in the South, so it's subject to reformation, meaning that black people are allowed to take these positions now. And because it's in the South and reformation is occurring, they're used to having black people in service roles like this. So when black people come into the industry of bartending post-Civil War, Louisville is a perfect fit for it. The same can't be said for Northern cities, actually. There's a hotel called the Atlas Hotel in Cincinnati, Ohio, which in the late 1800s hired black uh, bartender uh, Louis Deal. And there was a citywide boycott of the institution because they did that. And this is in the North, in Ohio. That is appalling. The birth of a new society that offers black people more freedom and more ability to work in various industries and hold jobs for themselves offers a lot of really positive, equitable opportunity. And that is how Thomas Bullock gets his start in hospitality. Now, Bullock becomes a bartender at the Penn Dennis Club in Louisville, Kentucky, which was established sometime around 1881. He doesn't start there until 1892, however, and starts there as a bellboy. Outside of that, unfortunately, there's not a lot of information that ties him to the Penn Dennis Club or his bartending experiences there. As it turns out, the Penn Dennis Club does not keep archival records of the individuals who worked there from this time period. This is prior to a move the Penn Dennis Club made to a more permanent location when they were working out of a mansion. It's a complicated scenario. There are a couple pieces of legend, though, that do tie uh, Thomas Bullock to the Penn Dennis Club, even if they may not necessarily be true. My favorite one in particular is actually the, or the legends of the origin of the old fashioned, which some say do does come from the Penn Dennis Club and was made potentially in a collaboration between Thomas Bullock and a member of the Pendennis Club, James E. Pepper. Now, unfortunately, cocktail writers and authors have 
disavowed that and, and proven that the recipes for an old fashioned go back significantly further. However, they do also state that the Pendennis Club was a major active role uh, in popularizing the old fashioned. So take and give. Thomas Bullock is res partially responsible for the popularization of the old fashioned. Aside from that story, though, there's not really much to say about Tom Bullock's time at the Pendennis Club. The only other major piece of information that I could find regarding his work there was a 1904 news article stating that his brother Clarence was filing a lawsuit against the Pendennis Club for personal damages related to an injury he received while, of all things, opening a bottle of club soda for a guest. Not gonna lie, I've been there. <laughs> While that may not have necessarily been the reason that he did leave, sometime around 1904, uh, Thomas does leave the Pendennis Club and instead goes to work at the Kenton Club, which was a very short-lived club opened in a rivalry with Pendennis uh, because a couple of businessmen didn't get their way and weren't allowed into the Pendennis Club. That's a stupid fucking reason to open a club, dude. Thomas did bartend there though for some time. Uh, unfortunately, the Kenton Club does not have any major records keeping regarding it. It is mentioned in a couple of uh, news articles and like, uh, I guess private listings in newspapers of the time, but there's no like website, no archival information, no history. So unfortunately, we don't really know how long he was there for or what he accomplished while he was at the Kenton Club. From that point on, Tom does a little bit of bouncing around, uh, and in fact, begins to work in the bar car of a railway line um, sometime around prob probably 1906, maybe? It's hard to put a date on any of these things because there's not a good record of when these changes occurred. These things weren't very well cataloged back in the day, and it becomes difficult to follow. We do know, though, that he was working in the bar car on the railway line, and at the time was living out of Cincinnati with his brother Clarence. There's also some mention that at, at this time he may have gone to Chicago to do some bartending work, but I could find no mention of where specifically uh, Thomas was working at the time, if he did do any work in Chicago. Regardless of what he was doing between his time at the Pendennis Club and uh, his following actions, leaving Chicago, leaving Cincinnati, he ends up settling in St. Louis, Missouri, where he lived with his widowed mother and began to work at the St. Louis Country Club. Now, the St. Louis Country Club is a big part of what made Tom Bullock famous. Not necessarily that they're the reason he was highlighted, but rather this was where he did some of his best work. And I want to do a quick aside and mention that in my research, I discovered that the St. Louis Country Club is a horribly anti-Semitic, racist society of golfers who intentionally left the East Coast official national golfing teams because they would not allow black members into their groups. They are associated with the WASP Society, which stands for the White Anglo-Saxon Protestant Society, essentially an extension of the KKK. They're bad people. Um, don't put any favor on them in the act of making Tom famous. He's famous for his own reasons, and let me tell you exactly how that's happened. Thomas starts to work at the St. Louis Country Club uh, after moving to St. Louis to live with his mother. And while he's there, he meets a lot of really important people uh, and gives them some of the best service that they've ever had. One of these people who you may know is George Herbert Walker, who at the time was a prominent banker, and you may know as the grandfather and great-grandfather of George H.W. and George W. Bush, respectively. Apparently, he was a member of the St. Louis Country Club. He was very fond of Tom's work. Uh, and in some instances, it's stated that he may have done some private bartending for George Walker as well. Regardless of what the extension of their of their partnership was, they were good friends. And when Tom does eventually publish his own cocktail manual, which we're still getting to, don't worry, I haven't forgotten to talk about that. When he does publish the book, George Walker does actually list a foreword there, and I want to read verbatim what George says about Tom's work. George writes in the foreword of uh, Tom's book, uh, several years after he starts at the St. Louis Country Club, stating, it is a genuine privilege to be permitted to testify to his qualifications for such a work. They're close, they're close friends, and that connection is part of a list of accolades uh, that prove Tom's effort and excellence at Barcraft. Because as a black man working at a historically racist institution, still being able to wow and impress and earn the respect of these frankly, really fucking horrible people. Um, it's proof that he's a phenomenal bartender and one who can defy the expectations set by the racist standards at the time to bring about a new age of hospitality. Now, the St. Louis Country Club was also host to plenty of other people. 
uh, and no less than former president at the time, Theodore Roosevelt. <laughs> See, Theodore Roosevelt was running for re-election in 1912, and prior to that having already been a member of the presidency, uh, some rumors began to spread from his constituents that he may, be, or may or may not be a prolific drunk. There were some very scathing articles written about him in various newspapers, so much so that it actually led to a libel suit that Roosevelt wins uh, sometime down the line. However, in the process of this libel suit being formed and these original inflammatory uh, news articles being written, Roosevelt releases like a press release, a response to some of these claims, and says, Since I have left the White House, I have had but two mint juleps, and on one such occasion he was at the St. Louis Country Club, and I had only a few sips. Now, at the time that he would have visited the St. Louis Country Club, Tom Bullock was bartending there. Which means that Tom Bullock did serve Theodore Roosevelt, former president, and I think future president at that point, um, a mint julep. This led to members of the St. Louis Dispatch, a news, uh, newspaper production company in St. Louis, Missouri, publishing an article stating, this is highly unlikely. Who has ever been known to take uh, only a few sips of one of Tom's creations? Going so far as to say, actually, there is no greater mixologist of any race than Tom Bullock. Uh, so, Needless to say, people stood the fuck up for this guy. He was respected. And that respect, that level of saying, hey, no, come on, this is uh, like, we're, we're cracking a joke here. This is an opinion article, but in truth, this guy is phenomenal. There's no way you only took two sips of that. Those articles brought Tom to the forefront of a major news event. And that led to an outstanding, incredible explosion of his popularity around the year 1912, 1913. Tom Bullock became famous for his preparations for juleps, which he had two styles for, I believe St. Louis and Louisville. I think St. Louis and Louisville style mint juleps. Uh, and they, and he just, he becomes so insanely popular. It's hard to describe. At that time, it's, it's not like the modern day where news can just make somebody famous in an instant and then the next day it goes away. No, he's highlighted to the top highest tier of mixologists up there with Henry, Henry people like Henry Craddock and I suppose um, David Embury from the 40s, you know? This makes him a celebrity of the mixology world. This fame brings him a lot of attention, a lot of support, a lot of respect, and leads to him publishing his cocktail manual, known as The Ideal Bartender, which was released in 1917. There's not a lot of written information about what this book, how this book rather was perceived when it was initially released, but a lot of cocktail historians, including David Wunderich and uh, Greg Boehm, who is the owner of Cocktail Kingdom, they state that this book is a perfect example of a pre-prohibition cocktail book because it comes right at the end of the period that we label as the pre-prohibition, uh, being released in 1917, just three years before prohibition hit, meaning that it is not only very, very good at discerning what people liked to drink right before prohibition hit, but also being one of the last cocktail books to be were released in that time period, and therefore one of the most accurate to the tastes of people who were drinking right smack dab at the beginning of Prohibition. It's a wonderful historical text, something that can be referred to in encyclopedic ways, and in the modern day is truthfully one of the great works of cocktail mixological art. Now, the book gets released in 1917, it's a success, uh, and then... 1920 hits and a prohibition is officially passed in national law, amended into the Constitution as the 18th Amendment. Uh, at that time, um, a lot of bartenders end up leaving the country to continue their practice. Some of them stop practicing bartending and come back once prohibition is repealed. Tom Bullock's history with it is actually a little bit unknown. Tom does maintain his employment at the St. Louis Country Club, but he is now labeled as a laborer or butler, and there's no good record of what exactly he was doing. So some authors attest that he did stop bartending, but others state that it's entirely possible that he would have continued. Unfortunately, from that point, Tom Bullock disappears from the public record. As early as 1927, there's not any mention of him in any form of public record anywhere. So whether or not he was continuing his bartending overseas or someplace a speakeasy, you know, it's there's no way to know, unfortunately. He disappears from the record and we don't know what happened. Unfortunately, that leaves us with the knowledge, essentially, that just that he died at some point, most likely in 1964. Um, and that's all she wrote. It's really a shame that somebody would hit such incredible fame and do such an amazing thing, releasing a book so unique and so important right before Prohibition hits in a kind of wipes them off the face of the planet. It's a real shame, actually.
Now, despite the fact that Tom Bullock does go from this point of incredible fame to incredible, I guess, nobodyism, um, he is still regarded as one of the major names in the mixological community. And thanks largely in part to the cocktail renaissance that spent a lot of time charging up old records and old cocktail books and remembering names and specs and charting things, uh, he is still well respected as a member of the mixological community today, especially now that we are going back and rectifying a lot of the racial injustices that exist in the world of mixology, which has historically been not only run by men, but specifically white, cis, het men. And to give Tom Bullock his fair share in the spotlight is a phenomenal thing that is becoming increasingly more common. There's a location in uh, St. Louis called the Planter's House, which is like a bar and restaurant. Uh, they actually have a Bullock room named in his honor. In 2013, uh, Duce established a uh, Excellence in Service Award uh, for the area of Washington, D.C., uh, for in Bullock's name, obviously, uh, for esteemed service. And then now, even in Kalamazoo, there's a location called Dabney Co., who I've discussed previously when we talked about John Dabney. Um, they themselves actually released a bunch of information about Tom Bullock and gave respect to him through some of their services, and I think they had a cocktail special featuring some of his work, or at least they were spreading his information and his legacy. He's been maintained in the modern day with the same amount of respect that he should have been maintained back in the late 1920s, where people still talked, people still spoke his name, and people still regarded him with great excellence, because that's what he was. Excellent. So that's the story of Tom Bullock, um, one of the best, most popular, most influential bartenders from the period that existed right before Prohibition and who managed to catalog the tastes of the people in a way, a way very few have, uh, with great accuracy and with great esteem. And it's honestly an honor to have learned about them because so few names deserve so much respect. And it's really great to see um, respect and the name of a black mixologist being maintained. As far as cocktails go, there doesn't really seem to be one in particular that, aside from mint juleps, I suppose, to, that Tom was really well known for. There's not really a single staple cocktail that was like his invention, his thing, something that people knew him for. David Wonderich does talk about him inventing what he says is a variation on a gimlet called a stone sour. Um, I don't see how that's a gimlet variation. It's a bourbon sour with orange juice in it. I I don't see how that's a gimlet. That said though, um, he does have a whole cocktail book filled with recipes that are super unique and super interesting. And I wanted to share one of those with you guys today, uh, but not the Stone Sour. Uh, instead, we are going to take a look at a cocktail called the Eldorado Punch. The Eldorado Punch uh, appears in The Ideal Bartender. It's one of those cocktail guides that's actually sorted alphabetically rather than by like base spirit or style of cocktail, like uh, stirred up style or like a, a flip or a sour or whatever. And, and technically speaking, pre-prohibition cocktails exist in a space that predates the official existence of the sour style cocktail. So there's still not necessarily um, the same thing. There's a little bit of difference in preparation styles and things like that. But this is, uh, I will say, a cocktail I've had before. I made one last night to test out some technique and see how I think it would work best. Uh, and uh, it's awesome. This cocktail is amazing. Uh, so let's go ahead and make an Eldorado punch. To start, we need to begin with one tablespoon, which is the same as three bar spoons of bar sugar. Technically speaking, based on the records that I've examined, uh, the idea of a bar sugar is actually less like granulated sugar and more like confectioner sugar, but without the starches that you would find there that are useful in baking because it would make cocktails lumpy and thick and gross. You can use either a syrup here. I would say it's three quarters of an ounce to an ounce of syrup would be equivalent. Next up, we're gonna grab a lemon here. And as a matter of fact, this calls for the juice of one whole lemon. Finally, for our spirit, we need a blend of Jamaican rum, whiskey, and uh, cognac or brandy. I'm gonna start that off with half an ounce of a Jamaican rum, half of an ounce of a, a whiskey, I'm using bourbon today, and one ounce of a brandy or cognac. Either way, it tastes great. That being said, what is the distinction between cognac and brandy? Brandy can be made anywhere, uh, but cognac is made specifically in Cognac, France. Uh, this one in particular is Pierre Ferrand, which is made with uh, champagne grapes, which are like a very specific varietal of grape. They're largely interchangeable, but cognac tends to be produced with a higher sort of standard for quality, and you'll generally get a better result out of something like this. So that's all of our ingredients. Let's go ahead and grab some ice. As always, we're gonna do one whole cube and one cube cracked. 
We're gonna cap that up, tap that down, and then give it a shake for 10 to 12 seconds to chill and combine. To serve this, I'm gonna grab a low ball glass. We're gonna go ahead and fill that up with some ice. We'll uncap our cocktail shaker and double strain that in. Now for garnish, uh, it's stated that we should dress this with fruit. So let's do that. I'm gonna grab just a little triangle of a lemon here, as well as a maraschino cherry. I'm gonna put both of these onto a cocktail pick here, like so. Rest those on our ice, just like that. And there you have, ladies and gentlemen, the Eldorado Punch. Alrighty, with our station ever so slightly cleaned up, let's go ahead and give our Eldorado Punch a taste. Cheers. <laughs> Every sip of that is like drinking liquid gold. <laughs> I see why you call it the Eldorado Punch. It's gold in color and it is liquid gold to your mouth. This is the best thing ever. <laughs> it's a really well-balanced drink. I think the slightly higher than one ounce measure of uh, lemon juice, which you know is what you would typically get from a, a whole lemon, is really helping to balance out that very raw sugary sweetness and help tame some of that variability. On top of that, those two ingredients, that sugar and citrus, pairs perfectly with every single one of the spirits that exists in here. You get just a little bit of that funky S3 Jamaican-iness from the rum, and then in the case of this bourbon, which is a bonded bourbon, it's slightly higher proof and reads more like tobacco and peanut, but you also get you know, really nice warming and smooth vanilla and oak and honey notes. And then that complements even further the cognac, which is very fruity, very stone fruity and very kind of it, sweet, but has this kind of nice tannicness to it from its barrel aging. Those three flavors come together perfectly. When you match them with the citrus and the sugar, there's there's just nothing better. This is just so, so perfectly executed. Oh my God. This is like a combination of flavors that you've never really experienced together before. I feel like there's no cocktail that perfectly exemplifies this in any similar way. Like I can't think of a cocktail that comes even remotely close to this. That kind of unfamiliarity is so refreshing and interesting and it tastes so good because it's not like anything you've had before and that's what makes it truly worth trying. Definitely opens up a lot of the wood impact of the spirits. There's this kind of very loud tannic note right at the start, but that weans away very quickly as the citrus and the sugar come up behind it and give it this nice bright acidity, but a balanced acidity at that, that allows those spirits to sort of flesh themselves out. And you just get this mosaic of flavors that are weaving together perfectly, but still have those distinguishable parts you're looking for. I can find the vanilla and the honey and the whiskey, and even some of the grain impact that the whiskey actually comes through pretty loudly for me. I get a lot of that. Outside of that, that very particular Jamaican funk is there, but it's had that edge cut off of it, that kind of abrasive edge that a lot of people don't like about Jamaican rum, that's gone. It's, it's replaced with this very pleasant and uh, acid balanced and sweetness balanced, characterful, rich, sugary, burnt caramel molasses flavor with just the right amount of funk to remind you that it's a Jamaican. And that cognac comes in and plays so nicely with the lemon because it's got this kind of like grape, apricot, um, cherry-like stone fruit flavor to it. And it's got this nice vanilla-ness from the aging and a very particular like, louder oak flavor. I don't find honey as much on cognac as I do oak. Uh, and it, it's just, oh man. <laughs> it's, it's so, so good. I don't, I don't know how else to say it. This is one of the best cocktails I've ever had in my entire life. It's not even necessarily a masterclass in the crafting of a cocktail. It is a masterclass in the blending of spirits, which is even more difficult. And the fact that it is executed so perfectly means just, just cheers to you, Mr. Bullock. Holy shit. My God, that is good. Oh my God. This is an amazing cocktail. 
um, one that very clearly exists prior to the modern rules we use for sour style cocktails, yet still implicitly understood how it should be done, how to do it well, and how to blend spirits together to make it even better than it could be with just one. And I... Good goddamn, I'm speechless. <laughs> The recipe for this is obviously going to be in the description down below, but I'm also going to leave a couple of recipes from uh, the beginning of Ideal Bartender, um, which is available at a link in the description down below, both for purchase and as part of a digital rep repository. I've just listed a couple of interesting interesting cocktails that I, I saw. There's one called the Black Cow that's um, two ounces of cream and uh, a whole bottle of sarsaparilla. And if sarsaparilla was still a thing, I would 100% try that. That sounds so interesting. Like, so just check them out. Go down in the description down below, um, read the life and legacy of Tom Bullock, um, buy a copy of The Ideal Bartender, and just embrace embrace this, this person. Um, history was not kind to Mr. Bullock for obvious reasons, um, for the, you know, in large, largely in part after 1927, it forgot him, uh, and he doesn't deserve that. Very clearly and plainly, as a person, but also as a mixologist, he is amazing. And we should give respect to him and his creations by ensuring that they never get forgotten. So, for you, Mr. Bullock, cheers. Anyway, that is all that I have for you today. Let's go ahead and read from our book, Crisp Toasts. We left off last time in the adversity section, and I had forgotten that at the time, uh, I actually had a quote from Shin and Mustafer, so I kind of cut that off. However, I do remember where we were at. So, today's toast goes as such. Laugh, and the world laughs with you. Weep, and it gives you the laugh anyway. Cheers. Thank you all so much for watching this episode of Mike's Hard Reviews. Hopefully you guys enjoyed it. If you did, go ahead and click that like button down below and subscribe to catch more episodes of the show. But really, I would rather you not do that. Skip over all that shit. Go to the description and read up on Tom Bullock and other similar black mixologists just like him. Uh, for example, we did uh, last year, we did a video on John Dabney, who was a former slave who bartended his way out of enslavement and, uh, freed his wife with his skill and craft and became a remark just go go watch the video and read up on him as well read up on tom bullock support a black owned business do fucking anything other than subscribe to my white ass please you can follow me on my socials they're on screen i don't give a shit um black use black history month as a means to better yourselves and understand history and i will see you all in the next episode remember to drink responsibly and have a great rest of your day cheers